Yeah, thank you. I know it's often um, a little awkward to set up and uh, conduct these Zoom lectures, but it's really a great privilege to be able to have an international conversation uh, in this way. And I think we'll get better and better at uh, connecting <laughs> virtually, I hope. Um, I uh, am very interested in what the um, program, the Economic Policy for the Global Transition is about. And what I want to do today is really convince you that in thinking about that transition, it's very important to engage with feminist theory and also with feminist research on care provision. And I am going to give um, one relatively short presentation that gives you some kind of theoretical background that relates to the readings that I distributed. And then I'm going to pause and see if you have questions about that. And um, if we are all in the mood, I'm going to then do another brief presentation, but I'm going to hold that in reserve and see how the conversation goes uh, with the first bit. I, I am. Um, I just think it's helpful, especially if you've just sat through a longer uh, lecture in person, uh, to have a more informal exchange with opportunity for interaction throughout, rather than waiting until after a really long presentation. So that's my plan. Let me just share the screen for my first presentation. Okay, uh, can you see it? Just let me know. I'm not hearing you now. We we can see the presentation. Uh, okay, good. <laughs> I'll just switch <laughs> off my mic so that you don't. Yeah, have no, noise. that's fine. But okay, perfect. So, so uh, I don't know if you've ever seen this this um, poster before. Uh, of the woman, of the dancer on top of the, the bull of Wall Street, but it appeared on the call for an occupation of Wall Street in 2011. And um, it's a famous photograph because this brass sculpture of a bull is, is the symbol of Wall Street. It's a sculpture that sits in front of the New York Stock Exchange. And uh, so it's it's kind of a bit of an icon for thinking about uh, capitalism and the meaning of other modes of production and the way in which gender fits into this uh, larger picture. But as you'll see, um, I'm going to take an approach to thinking about capitalism that is uh, very different from the conventional uh, Marxian approach. So sometimes people assume that feminist political economy is just about gender inequality, but I think it actually has more uh, profound implications because it helps explain the co-evolution of inequalities that are based not just on gender, but also on class, on race, ethnicity, and a lot of other dimensions of socially assigned group identity. So I I don't know, in Europe, perhaps you don't hear this phrase so much as we do in the US, but every man for himself is kind of the libertarian, Darwinian, survivalist motto. And uh, this concept of every man for himself, where you know, the pursuit of individual self-interest is kind of built in to the structure of a lot of neoclassical economic theory that emphasizes the pursuit of individual self-interest. But as the um, discourse about global climate change has emerged, it's become increasingly clear that this reliance on individual self-interest is a recipe for extinction. And this is the uh, this logo is the sign of the activist group Extinction Rebellion. And in, in my view, thinking about the threats to the physical climate is an important way of thinking about threats to the social climate and thinking about the sustainability of what we call the economy um, 
makes it really important to think about the sustainability of families and communities and and um, and care provision. So that's why I think we want to center care and rethink some of the key words of political economy. So you'll see that my jumping off point is very much uh, based on the Marxian tradition, but um, it's definitely a jumping off uh, in, a new, in a new direction that I want to explain. So what do I mean by care? It's a complicated word. Uh, it often has slightly different nuances in different languages. And I just want to clarify that as an economist, when I speak about care, I'm talking about the production, the development, and the maintenance of human capabilities. So in some ways, it's similar to the concept of human capital that economists often rely on. But it's a broader concept because most human capital theory only looks at market earnings and factors that influence current and future earnings. And here I'm pointing to a much broader definition of capabilities that are relevant, not just to the market, but to families, communities, uh, and to the future itself. And uh, this is a task, this is an economic activity that has a lot of distinctive characteristics. And um, I'm just gonna really outline them very briefly here and hope that you'll have questions or comments that can help flesh out um, the meaning of it in more detail. But care usually requires at least some concern for the well-being of others. And the reason for that is that it's not always an exchange. Often it's it's a transfer. The person who's receiving care is often uh, unable to exercise much choice or much consumer sovereignty, uh, unable to go someplace else if they're not getting care provision in one place that they like. So I'm referring to young children, people who are suffering from illness or disability or the frailness of old age. I'm talking about um, meeting people's needs, which is very different from meeting the quote unquote demand that's expressed uh, through the market and exchange. And this perspective on care, it's very important to note that it looks beyond exchange. It includes exchange. Uh, but it's, it also includes uh, transfers to people who are unable to effectively uh, engage in exchange. So uh, this process of care provision includes a lot of unpaid work, or what is sometimes called non-market work or household production. It also includes some categories of paid work, and it also includes transfers of money. I think most attention in this research literature is focused on care work, but um, Care finance uh, is also really important because you need capital and raw materials to engage in care provision, as in other economic activities. You you can't you can't do housework if you don't have a house. Um, so uh, a very general and widely accepted theme in this literature is that women provide a disproportionate share of care, both paid and unpaid care provision, and this. Uh, specialization on their part really contributes to their economic vulnerability. So it's very important for understanding gender inequality, but it's also important to understanding the nature of a larger set of vulnerabilities. So the one of the reasons that um, care tends to be economically disempowering is it's very difficult to individually capture its economic benefits. So, you know, uh, you, you don't own, you can't own or claim the, the products of care because basically care is enhancing or developing or producing the capabilities of other people. And the other people are the primary beneficiaries but care also has a multiplier effect. That is, if you care for someone, they are more likely to be able to care for someone else. And uh, when you help produce and maintain human capabilities, that's helping out the employers that are hiring those capabilities in the future. And it's also helping out uh, the public sector 
because you're ensuring capabilities to be productive and to contribute tax revenues, which are really relevant to the finance of social programs and the sustainability of the system as a whole. So creating and maintaining and developing healthy people is uh, very much a public good in the same sense that the, the uh, environment maintaining a, uh, a, a sustainable climate or a stable climate uh, and a, a, a sustainable ecosystem uh, is really important. And I think the, these analogies are really important because they provide a kind of conceptual foundation for building alliances between um, the environmental movement and the care movement uh, for alliances for thinking about the social climate in terms similar to the physical climate. So in my view, uh, distributional struggle over the distribution of the net benefits of care provision is just as significant as struggle over quote unquote surplus value. So what I mean by this distributional struggle is who's going to pay for taking care of the kids? Who's going to pay for taking care of the elderly? Who's going to pay for taking care of people who are sick or disabled? And who's going to drive the primary benefits from that? And because care is very costly, um, taking on care responsibilities almost always entails some reduction in the consumption uh, and leisure of the people providing it. And uh, it adds up in terms of hours and dollars to a very uh, significant share of the economic total um, that's just uh, often ignored because we don't assign a clear economic or market-driven value um, uh, to these transfers. So again, parallels between the social and the physical climate that have to do with coordination problems arising from exploitation of unpriced goods and services and, and public goods, deterioration of public goods. So sometimes there's a tendency to kind of romanticize care provision to think of it as, you know, a very almost, you know, very feminine, stylized feminine sentiment of uh, you know, altruistic concern uh, for others, but uh, care is actually not all sweetness and love. It plays a pretty significant role in uh, group conflict. So uh, a lot of group conflict is based on in-group loyalties, uh, willingness to sacrifice your time and energy or your even your life for the benefit of those in your group, in your, however you define that in-group. Um, and that is what enables the successful competition or, of a group or a team with other groups. And of course, military conflict is the most extreme example of that. But um, we also see this in-group, out-group dynamic on a very mundane level in, in games and sports. Um, and we see it in the kind of uh, conflicting group loyalties and allegiances that are part of the complexity of historical change. So um, especially in the Marxist literature, there is a, a, a pretty significant tendency to locate inadequate care provision or exploitation of care providers with the beginning of neoliberal capitalism. And I, I don't think the historical record supports that claim. In fact, uh, you can't even argue that it originated with feudalism, much less capitalism. It's very significant historical evidence of patriarchal institutions that pre-exist these conventional uh, modes of production and that are very similar to other forms of hierarchical control based on race or national identity, national membership that uh, involve both uh, direct coercion, force and violence, and also indirect or, or institutional control. So this requires, thinking about this, um, really requires acknowledgement of the complexity of intersecting and overlapping dimensions of collective identity and conflict. And that is what I wanna uh, turn my attention to next. So, um, Often the the kind of the received wisdom of a of a 
quote unquote class analysis is based on these binary uh, oppositions. Like some people people have some economic interests that, that are based on class and they have some social identities that are based on their gender or their sexuality or their ethnic identity or their national origins or their religion. And somehow uh, the economic interests take precedence over the, the social identities. So, uh, you know, looking at trying to understand the world today, you could look at class divisions, you can look at non-class divisions. And I think in general, the class divisions uh, get more attention from economists on the left than they do uh, from others. And that's reflected in a difference in language in the use of the words exploitation and oppression. So, so say like, well, women aren't really ex exploited because they don't create surplus value, but they're oppressed. And uh, my basic approach is to challenge all of these binaries. And to do that, uh, I kind of want to redefine what we mean by the economic, uh, because I think the economic is much bigger and broader than um, the received tradition has uh, described it. So there are four key terms that I think play a, a particularly important role in the discourse of uh, modern kind of Marxian and neo-Marxian thinking about historical transitions. And these four key terms are production, mode of production, social reproduction, and exploitation. So I'm going to just look at these briefly in turn and explain how I want to um, uh, transform these concepts. So um, in classical political economy, not just Marx, but Ricardo and, and Smith, um, and a lot of modern Marxian and neo-Ricardian approaches, uh, production is really about the production of goods and services for consumption or exchange, but labor itself is not produced. Labor is taken as exogenously given. You know, Piero Straffa wrote a famous book called The Production of Commodities by Means of Commodities. He never looked at the production of people by means of people. He never looked at the amount of time or money required to raise uh, the next generation. And, you know, modern economic accounting really centers on the concept of gross domestic product, which is the, the value of the final value of all goods and services that are purchased, bought and sold uh, through the market, which, which excludes both natural assets, um, clean water, clean air, fish in the sea, trees in the forest, um, all of those lacking a market value for the most part are not included. Uh, much less ecological services and en environmental sustainability. And likewise, the unpaid work of um, people, women and men, uh, which is quantitatively quite significant, even in the most advanced capitalist countries, uh, is excluded from gross domestic product. And I think that's created a very misleading picture of economic output and the economic system as a whole. And um, just as a sidebar, there are now efforts underway to develop quote unquote satellite accounts that impute a market value to non-market work um, and that impute a value to ecological services and so forth. And I think that's a very important advance and that is kind of um, a theme that I can return to in my second presentation if I get there. But I just want to emphasize that those efforts remain very partial and very incomplete. And in my view, they continue to really underestimate the value, the economic value of non-market assets and non-market uh, services, among them the production the development and the maintenance of human capabilities. So in traditional Marxian theory, we look back at history and describe these uh, stylized sequences 
first primitive communism, then petty commodity production or feudalism and or feudalism and then petty commodity production and then capitalism and then theoretically socialism. And I think this concept of stylized sequences is really out of date and um, no longer has much persuasive power. And I would like to replace this idea of sequences with kind of a more a, a picture of more intersecting, overlapping, recombinant structures of collective power um, with new forms of hierarchy overlaid upon the old ones, making them more complicated, sometimes reinforcing them and sometimes uh, conflicting with them. And I think this is um, a kind of image that helps explain a lot of the political complexities that we face in the world today. And if you if you're a visual thinker, you might imagine it as a set of overlapping hierarchies where people kind of uh, are often in contradictory positions, uh, but uh, engaged in or involved in or affected by a number of um, very different um, hierarchical rules and systems that affect their individual constraints and their individual opportunities. So there's now a lot of interest in the uh, Marxist feminist literature in particular on the concept of social reproduction. And I think this is healthy and great uh, because it, it's moving the lens, it's widening the lens beyond the production of goods and services. Uh, so I'm, I will, I'm very enthusiastic about this literature, but I do have criticisms of this literature because it often focuses just on the social reproduction of capitalism and it views capitalist dynamics and capitalist um, kind of divisions as the primary actors in uh, social conflict. And I think that's too simple. And I also think it's true that every society develops institutional structures to promote its social reproduction, not, not just capitalism. And I think that patriarchal structures were uh, at a very early stage of human history, the way in which social re reproduction was structured and that those aspects of that structure uh, remain very much in force today, although parts of them are growing kind of shaky and beginning to fall apart, they still exercise a significant influence. So, uh, <laughs> I, I've always loved this poster from the Red Women's Workshop. It's kind of a visual image of social reproduction, observing that capitalism also depends on domestic labor. This is absolutely true, a really good point. So you see the workers coming out of the factory and into the assembly line of the home where women are restoring their ability to work and they're going back into uh, the factory. but. I just want you to observe that this image, while very uh, powerful in terms of capturing the um, parallels between paid work and unpaid work and their complementarity, all the workers are faceless, uh, identical, no racial ethnic differences, no no loyalties other than you know there's no there's there's a workplace, the factory and a workplace, the assembly line of the home. Uh, but there are no children and there are no elderly in the picture. So <laughs> domestic, you know, a, a theory of social reproduction has to look beyond kind of the reproduction of labor power as it moves into the paid economy and look also at um, uh, other parts of the population and the conflicting loyalties and allegiances that they experience. So... I think this is probably pretty familiar to you, so I hope I'm not belaboring the obvious. Um, but I think a more general definition of exploitation than the one offered in traditional Marxism, and I developed this further in the book that I sent you some excerpts of to read. And I think the more general definition can be kind of framed in terms of a bargaining model where uh, 
unfair advantage of another person or a group makes it possible to capture an unfair share of the gains from uh, cooperation. And I think this is kind of the general idea behind exploitation that depriving workers of access to the means of production makes it possible for employers to exploit them. But I think there are many other examples of taking unfair advantage. Um, and for instance, one might think about rules of citizenship uh, that restrict access uh, to more affluent uh, economies as very much based on uh, ultimately on the force and violence that makes it possible to seize migrants and basically deport them to their uh, countries of origin. I don't mean to suggest that it's easy to agree on definitions of unfair advantage, but I do think it's a concept that really um, needs to be broadened behind the idea of the exploitation, beyond the idea of exploitation of the, of the wage earner. So I think this approach has some really important historical applications. I can't, I don't really have time to go into them here, but I think uh, it speaks to the question of the origins of patriarchal and feudal structures. Uh, and the chapter six that I sent you is kind of a, uh, fleshes that out in more detail. It, it says something also about their tensions and synergies with capitalist institutions. Um, it tells us, tells us something about the convergence of national and class interests in colonialism, um, kind of in some ways very complementary with early Marxist ideas about the aristocracy of labor. Um, it, it's really uh, helpful in thinking about the emergence of welfare states and the, and the shape that the uh, public finance of welfare states has taken and changes in the shapes of gender inequality. In general, women have gained um, many more rights than they've had in the past, but um, women's specialization and care provision continues to put them at an economic disadvantage. I think that the alliances that have emerged uh, partly as a result of the, the complexity of overlapping inequalities that I'm emphasizing is also really helpful to explaining the rise of populism, which is in many places a kind of alliance between nationalist and racist and, and very uh, patriarchal um, priorities. Uh, so it's kind of a putting, putting together a lot of older dimensions of identity into a package that has proved pretty politically uh, powerful in the current um, economic and political uh, world that we're living in. So that's why I think it's useful to think about, you know, if you want to think about transitions, it's helpful to look at the past and say, ask, well, how did transitions take place in the past? And how did they come into being and how did they evolve and what, you know, why, why, why do some of them fade away uh, and how? And just to condense the story that I tell in the book about the rise of patriarchal institutions, I think that patriarchal societies were able to expand at the expense of others, partly as a result of control over women's reproductive capabilities. Patriarchal societies had very pronatalist strictures. They limited women's access to any other activities other than uh, raising children and providing family care. Um, a lot of early warfare involved the capture of young women and ens enslavement of young women in ways that increased the size of the aggressive group. And when patriarchal societies expanded, we were people were living in a very labor intensive world, labor intensive in terms of military power and also productive capacity. So uh, population growth, especially in period, you know, in, in places with, in situations with pretty high mortality, population growth was really key to economic and military success and patriarchal institutions really encouraged that uh, rapid population growth. And once those forms of domestication of women and control over women emerge, it becomes 
uh, um, easier to overlay other hierarchical systems on top of them that have a kind of stabilizing effect and uh, facilitate co-optation. So you might have you. So what you see is that women themselves are divided uh, by class and by race and by nation nationality. So that reduces their incentives to challenge uh, uh, patriarchal institutions. And um, that's also true of uh, the complexity of capitalist inequalities. Yes, work there are workers and capitalists in rich countries, but in general, whether you're a worker or a capitalist, you're in a much better economic environment, much more privileged economic situation if you're living in an affluent country than in a really uh, poor country. So um, it becomes difficult to identify which institutional inequalities and forms of exploitation are the most um, or are, are are likely to be uh, uh, the best target of, of resistance. And in many ways, if you're deriving at least some privileges from the status quo, you become reluctant, more reluctant to uh, challenge um, aspects of it that might affect the relative privileges that you are still enjoying. I, I think this really comes through in, in terms of thinking about the impact of national citizenship on political identity. So patriarchal institutions have declined in very significant ways. And I think they've declined in part because of the contradictory effects of overlapping systems that racial and national and class inequalities put some women into privileged positions. And that gave them some leverage in terms of uh, demanding rights and finding political voice. Um, capitalist development also really undermined families as units of production and reproduction, and it pulled women into independent employment. So yes, women are exploited by capitalists in wage employment, but sometimes that actually gives them more independence than uh, relegation uh, to a subservient role in a patriarchal household where they have uh, little choice but to specialize in, in family care. I think a big impact comes from fertility decline, that as women have fewer kids and become less specialized in reproductive work, they gain more independence because uh, they're now engaging in activities that benefit them more directly. And but also, this is really key, women were sometimes able to overcome their differences in a political movement and organize collectively for their rights. And I think that collective action has played a really important role in the transformations that we've seen. But on the other side of the ledger, there are some good reasons to see why patriarchal institutions have persisted. And to reiterate what I was saying before, privileged groups, whatever they're based on, tend to favor existing hierarchies because they give people something to lose by an attack on unfair advantage or unfair privilege. Um, we see a lot of occupational segregation uh, with women in paid employment, specializing in care provision, heavily concentrated in education and healthcare. Um, this is true in Europe as well as the U.S. Welfare state policies also reinforce women's uh, specialization through uh, a lot of different aspects of public policy, um, including policies that make it very difficult to combine um, uh, lucr lucrative employment with, with care provision. Um, it's true that people have fewer children now many fewer children than they have in the past, and that that has had a positive effect on women's bargaining power. But it's also true that the, the demands for child quality, for educating children and enabling them to compete effectively in a capitalist economy have um, become uh, pretty intense. And as the population ages, the needs and demands of an older and increasingly um, 
feeble older population uh, imposes new care, care demands and women tend to take more responsibility for that as well as for childcare. And in some ways, I think both employers and men have gained increased opportunities to free ride on women's care work, They're basically saying, oh, well, they want to do it. They must be getting pleasure from it. So they, we don't really need, we're not going to really analyze this in economic terms or think about who might be benefiting from it. Uh, we're just going to hope and pray that they continue doing it. And if they don't, we'll just take away some of their uh, rights and put them back into that um, uh earlier situation of coercion that I'm speaking of, the rollback of reproductive rights, rights to abortion in the U.S., which is very much an um, example of a pushback against women's increased economic independence. So, okay, I'm almost... I'm almost Sorry, almost, Nancy? Yes. Nancy, we have a, a problem now, just for the last uh, 20 seconds. I yeah. don't know. Does the sound, okay, just try to talk. Very strange because the, we don't touch anything. Okay, please continue, let's see. Okay. Uh, fine, fine. I, nothing's changed on my end. I can still hear you pretty well. Yeah, no, no, on our, so <laughs> I don't know. No, it's fine, it's fine, we, we hear you again. Well, sometimes it's just, they're just mysteries in the, in cyberspace. <laughs> let's say it, it's the case. <laughs> okay, we'll hope for the best. Well, uh, okay, just by way of a, of a, of a kind of reprise of what I've been talking about. I I just want to kind of remind you where it's coming from. So I'm taking some concepts from Marxian political economy. Uh, I'm really emphasizing the importance of collective identity and collective conflict. I'm really embracing the tradition of historical materialism, trying to think about social evolution um, as something that's shaped by the forces of production, um, but defining production much more broadly. And also the in the Marxian tradition, I think the emphasis on contradiction and complexity, um, um, the dialectic, as it were, uh, whereby the powerful become uh, often end up becoming powerless as a result of their inflexibility and resistance uh, to change. So that's part of the genealogy. But there are also some tools in this approach that are drawn from neoclassical economics and institutionalism. There's a lot of game theory uh, in my approach uh, because a lot of it's about coordination problems. I think that uh, bargaining models um, are really useful in thinking about transitions. And I'm not so much talking about the non-cooperative bargaining models that are the mainstay of, of game theory, but uh, cooperative models about contracting and contracting problems and how contracts evolve and why contracts are often really difficult um, to enforce and how people form alliances um, with other subgroups to uh, um, try to uh, reach their goals. And then obviously this concept of free riding on public goods, although it has, it, it undermines some traditional neoclassical assumptions, it did emerge pretty early in neoclassical thinking, the recognition that um, uh, there were significant externalities and, and uh, uh, unintended consequences of market exchange. And modern environmental economics really builds very heavily on that issue of, of free riding. So then what is it that what is it that feminist theory brings into the picture? Well, three things that care is really crucial to economic sustainability. And it's not just part of mother nature and we can't just take it for granted. And that women, although very divided in other ways, share some collective interests as care providers. And that uh, we see collective struggle over the distribution of the cost of care, who's gonna pay for it and who's gonna drive the benefits. And that's 
also true in, in intergenerational terms in terms of thinking about you know what what future generations will inha will inherit from us in terms of the sustainability of the of the global ecosystem. So uh, I'm just going to end this presentation here with another sculpture that was temporarily placed on on um, Wall Street in front of that bull. It's called the Fearless Girl. She didn't last very long there because I think that uh, certain uh, groups didn't like the political implications, but I think her her defiant stance there is kind of a nice way for us to think about what we need to do. All right, so thanks for your attention, and let's just take a pause here and have some uh, comments or questions, and then we can decide if you want to hear me talk some more or not. <laughs>